Monorails are often seen as a sleek, futuristic way of getting around, and to many are what first springs to mind when people are asked what they envision the future of transport to be. So why then, even today, are monorails still few and far between, despite the technology existing for over a century now? Well, to answer that, we're going to have to take a closer look at how they work and how they compare to a standard rail system. On paper, a monorail's design seems very appealing. Because they need to be raised off the ground, a monorail system has a much smaller footprint than a railway or light rail system, allowing for cars and pedestrians to move beneath them. On top of this, they also don't need to share space with other kinds of traffic, meaning there's little to no disruption to services. Most monorails use rubber-tired wheels to grip the rail, which not only allows them to climb steeper gradients, but also makes them very quiet compared to cars, trains and trams. Like trams, they can run on electricity, allowing them to be powered with renewable energy, and many monorail cars are designed to wrap around the track, making it almost impossible for them to derail. With all these upsides, surely monorails are the future of public transport, right? Well, while the basic concept of a monorail seems viable, their main issue comes from the rails and the infrastructure around them. Firstly, in order to remain stable, a monorail's rail needs to be either very wide or very tall, meaning the cars on the monorail will need to be taller or wider than an average dual rail car to fit on the track. Should the monorail need to pass through a tunnel or under a bridge, it would require a bigger space to allow it to pass through safely. On top of this, the cars weigh roughly the same as a standard light rail car, meaning the same amount of engineering and resources would be needed to build a raised track segment for both. And given that a standard tram or light rail train has a smaller profile than a monorail, it makes more sense to invest in the one with a smaller profile, especially in an urban area. Secondly, the nature of the rails makes switching and shunting monorail cars significantly more complex than it needs to be. With a standard dual track layout, the direction of the train can be very easily changed by sliding a piece of rail a few inches either to the left or the right. These switches can be adjusted manually and are simple to repair and maintain, and because they sit at ground level, they can be accessed easily by workers. The worst case scenario if a switch is misaligned or broken is the train simply going the wrong way. Way. To change lines on a monorail, an entire segment of track needs to move, either rotating or bending to connect one line to another. Not only does this add more points of failure, but it also leaves segments of the rail that just end with little to no safeguards to prevent a car from simply driving off. On top of this, because monorails need to be suspended off the ground, the rails themselves as well as points and switches are significantly harder to access, and as a result are much harder to repair should things go wrong and require workers to work at a height, adding another unnecessary factor of danger to the repairs. But if being set at a height is the main problem for repair and maintenance of the rail, then why not set it at ground level? Well, that's where the third problem with monorails comes in, their compatibility with other forms of infrastructure. A standard double rail only needs to be set a few inches into the ground in order to be level with roads and safely allow both pedestrians and cars to cross over it. Because most monorails rail tracks are significantly taller than standard rails, they cannot be laid at ground level without becoming long barriers that require either further design to swing open and allow people to pass through, or stairs built around them. This could be avoided by digging trenches and setting the rails into the ground, but then clearance would still be required around the edges of the tracks, meaning you'd just have these broad trenches everywhere and would require drawbridges or other similar bridges to allow people and cars to cross over them. As well as this, most urban rail systems use standard gauge track, which allows them to connect to other rail networks and transfer rolling stock, with urban rail networks still able to transport freight as well as passengers seamlessly from one line to another. Monorails, on the other hand, don't have this compatibility. They can only run rolling stock built specifically for that monorail, which rules out longer distance services and means passengers would have to transfer between monorail and other forms of transit where no change may have been necessary otherwise. It also means that any goods or non-passenger traffic would need its own specially built car in the rare event the monorail was needed to transport something other than people. A car or wagon that on most other rail systems could be very easily and cheaply acquired and ran from another railway. Fourth is maintenance. 
Because monorail segments are suspended above the ground, not only is it more difficult to access them for repairs, but it also means that should a segment of track become damaged, it's likely the whole rail segment would need to be replaced, which is not only going to take longer, but also requires a replacement track section to be specially made. A railway or light rail system is much easier and cheaper to repair, as not only is it mostly laid on the ground, but rails are very common and very cheap in comparison. A damaged rail can be easily pulled up, welded and replaced while monorail tracks need more specialised equipment. And finally, in the event of an emergency, breakdown or carriage failure, monorails are significantly worse to be stuck in. If a tram or light rail carriage breaks down, they're usually close to ground level so passengers can easily get out and move to safer places. Even on high bridges, there's usually enough walking space besides the line to allow a person to traverse it safely. The only time it's almost impossible to get out of a broken down tram is if it's in a very narrow tunnel, but these situations are still rare. Monorails on the other hand, especially hanging monorails, rarely have any sort of walkway or area for anyone to safely dismount should the car break down. Not only is it nearly impossible to safely get out of the carriage, but the fact monorails need to be elevated in order to work effectively also adds another factor of danger should anyone ever need to get out of a monorail carriage at any part of the line that isn't a station. Overall, the many flaws monorails present in the long term make them just too impractical practical as large-scale transportation. Their futuristic appearance is what mostly gives them their broad appeal, but despite seeming outdated in comparison, trains, trams and buses are far better options as they are vastly cheaper and easier to operate and maintain. While several cities have built monorails that still operate today with varying degrees of success, they were mostly built at a time when monorails were still seen as flashy and futuristic and mostly designed to be more fashionable than functional. An example of this would be the Sydney monorail opened in 1988. Not only was it $20 million more expensive to build than a light rail alternative, but it also carried less passengers and tickets were more expensive, on top of the added difficulties of maintaining it. It was eventually closed in 2013. All that being said, while they are a terrible choice for mass transit, some monorail designs aren't entirely useless. The Road Machines monorails were simple monorail systems designed in the 1940s for use on construction sites and other similar environments. Rather than carrying wheelbarrows full of supplies back and forth along the same path or driving heavy tractors or lorries that could ruin fields or get bogged down in mud, temporary tracks could be laid around the site and an automated carriage could be set to go between stops. It was only meant for transporting tools, rubble and cement, so smoothness or ride quality didn't matter, meaning the prefabricated rails could be quickly set up, allowing for fast and automatic transport of supplies. In Germany, Switzerland and Italy, mainly around the Alps, monorack rails are frequently used for transporting supplies up steep and uneven gradients, primarily around orchards and vineyards. While they're short and used mostly for private or agricultural practices, the fact they can climb steep gradients, tackle tight bends, and safely traverse the environment regardless of weather conditions makes them far more practical than cars, tractors, or other off-road equipment. So, all in all, monorails are pretty poor as transport goes. Despite their futuristic reputation, compared to trains, light rail, or even buses, they tend to be over-engineered and gimmicky, and in the long run, less efficient at their job compared to more conventional forms of public transit. Most public monorails running today tend to either exist as a result of governments getting caught up in hype around their futuristic style, or due to specific circumstances in place that make them more viable than the previously listed means of transport. While they have found a much better application on smaller scales and work outside of public transit, monorails on almost any other scale or application tend to be all flash and no bang. A shame really, cause that Simpsons song was really catchy. Subscribe for more.